Federal indictment had sealed on Friday charges former President Donald Trump with 37 counts stemming from an investigation into the presence of a trove of classified information at his Florida state and other locations, according to Politico posted yesterday. Prosecutors led by special counsel Jack Smith alleged that Trump arranged to remove a massive collection of highly sensitive classified material, much of which consists of intelligence about the defense and weapons capabilities of the United States and foreign countries to his private residence as he left the White House in January 2021. Um, this is a an egregious uh, crime, actually, because it involves classified material. Now, there's three different classifications. You have top secret, confidential, and secret. And each one has a level of classification that you have to go to and what specific people can look at. And what Trump did, and we're not talking about the brightest of bulbs here, Trump actually had his aides stash these records of boxes that included, you know, his personal items from the White House and ordered them shipped to his estate in Mar-a-Lago. And everybody, you know, you you saw the video at the beginning where, the, you know, the FBI is walking out with the boxes of and um, out of his Mar-a-Lago estate. Now, according to the indictment, which I'm going to link at the bottom of the screen, the 49-page document also said that on at least um, two occasions, Trump actually showed these classified records to visitors without any security clearances at his golf club in ben Benminster, New Jersey, including a map of a military operation to a representative of his political committee, putting him in danger. And the um, Justice Department began inquiring about the records stashed at Trump's home. And according to the, the, the indictment, even alleged that Trump ordered an aide who goes by the name uh, Walt Nauda. Um, and Walt Nauda is um, an aide to Donald Trump, who is also uh, being indicted, um, began moving boxes with the classified records to obscure them from investigators. And you people actually think President Bush ordered 9-11. It just, you, you have to understand, Presidents don't know shit. That is called plausible deniability. Compartmentalization. The smartest people in the room are not in the White House. They're not in Congress. The actual smartest people in the room don't want you to know they even exist. They are the ones with information. They are the ones who plan orchestrate, conduct operations, collect intelligence, signals are human. And these people work in the intelligence community, in the military. They are not in Congress. They're the representatives of the people, you, okay? And the majority of the people, unfortunately, and this is what kills me, are ignorant regarding the most basic, trivial, important things relating to you, never mind the elaborate and really important political information and what's happening abroad because we have no idea, because the media won't tell us, because the media actually misinforms us and you believe what the media tells you. And it's all, I really, I, that's why I made this channel so that I can act as a, a nonpartisan, unbiased source of information in which, you know, I, I'm not really smart at all. So, I mean, I'm shooting this out of my bedroom, right? So, but I'm trying to make, you know, be an influence to other people to open up their channels and do the same. Because we all have a duty to report things without bias or prejudice. This is how we inform people. 
This is what the media should be doing. The fifth column, as they're called. But they were they serve against us because they serve in the interest of who? Corporations. And corporations have loyalties to either Democrat or Republican parties. Now, when it comes to, like I said, when it comes to domestic issues, there's a left and right. Keeps the division going. Keeps you people fighting each other. But when it comes to the greater geopolitical, apolitical issues happening abroad, there is no left and right. Don't believe me? Go look at the NAPAC conference. Do you see Democrats and Republicans fighting each other? No. They're conjoined. Now, let's get back to Trump's predicament. He's actually facing 31 charges of violating the Espionage Act. Boy. Through willful retention of classified documents and also, if that wasn't enough, six counts, including obstruction of justice and false statements, all federal charges, stemming from his alleged efforts to impede the investigation. Now, Nauda is being charged with six felonies relating to the alleged cover-up involved. Remember, he moved those documents to for so the FBI couldn't uh, um, obtain them. Jack Smith uh, basically said, quote, we have one set of laws in this country. They apply to everyone. End quote. I'm going to call him a hypocrite. Because <laughs> in just a minute, I'm going to prove to you that there is only one set of laws. And therefore, the common people, not for people like Trump. Now, he may get sentenced. Who knows? Because this might cause a rift in the American public and those whack jobs Trumpers are going to react because they're reactionary usually people of the ultra conservative mindset are need I remind you what ultra conservative it is it doesn't mean politics it also means religion we saw that in the mid 1990s through Wahhabi Salafis which are ultra conservative They're not progressive. Now, to make matters worse, if all if Trump is ultimately tried and convicted on all 37 counts, he faces life in prison. Because each count of willful retention records a maximum 10-year sentence, minimum three. The obstruction charges carry a 20-year maximum sentence, minimum 10. False statements charges each carry a five-year maximum. And what, what is Trump, 78? 77? He's dead, right? I'm hesitant because I remember when Ronald Reagan uh, and the Iran-Contra affair and His aides, Poindexter, his lawyers, were all charged with obstruction. And this basically, they all got parked. So I'm, I'm really hesitant about a president sitting in, in jail. Now, if I'm thinking nefariously, that just take this as a grain of salt. I'm just hy hypothetically here. If Donald Trump is found guilty, and you already know his base, which are fanatics, and not to pick on just the Trumpers, you know, we have fanatics to the left like Antifa and these California groups. Um, I forgot that one guy's name. He's a radical leftist. And, you know, there's other smaller groups that are just as fanatic, but Trumpers are really fanatic because these are evangelicals and ultra conservatives. They just are very reactionary, right? If Trump gets charged and he's found guilty, I heard a, a scenario where the FBI basically will offer him a deal and say, 
you're not to run for president. Yeah, we'll we'll knock off the majority of the charges, but you can never run for office. And of course, DeSantis by default will be the Republican nominee, right? Because he's the second most popular. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. I think the worst, because I'm always thinking the worst. Trump gets charged, found guilty of half of these charges, and he gets like a 20-year prison sentence, or even 10 years. All of a sudden, the Trump advocates like Lauren Boebert or Marjorie Taylor Greene or Matt Gates, and all the incendiary online personas on Twitter and TikTok and Twitch and um, that one site, I, I forgot the name of it, but um, they'll, they'll see this as an act of civil war. Oh, look what the left does, because they all they all basically claim that the FBI, the CIA, the intelligence services, everybody's left to them. If nobody, if you're not supporting Trump, you're up to the left. Meanwhile, people like me exist. I think the left and right are, are enemies of the state. Anyway, Truth Social, that was the name of the site. So you'll have a reaction. You, you might get that one guy who basically will, like, bomb a federal FBI building somewhere in the States or, you know, just start pockets of resistance somewhere in the South, the Midwest or something. And this would actually serve for the interests of the state because then, then you have this left and right extremism that will feed off each other because you'll have people from the left just as extremists not as reactionary, though, but they'll feed because they feed each other. If we had moderate politicians who were level headed, who weren't persuaded by ideology, who basically are the opposite of Biden and Trump, meaning there were young men who are basically intelligent. Biden's a mummy. Trump is a semi literate mummy. We're laughing stock, in other words. I bet you that the extremists of the right and left wouldn't exist anymore. They exist because each side was made to exist for each other. Anyway, the left basically, now this is your turn, left. This is not a left video because I'm not a leftist or a right uh, supporter. I don't support ideology. Anyway, when the indictment came out on Twitter, boy, did the left celebrate. And I saw channels like Pod for America and Representative Eric Solwell, uh, CNN, were actually celebrating this. Which you have to, like, you know... They're like almost simultaneously brainwashing you, manipulating you to react. Right? The real moral response would have been sadness. Because if they really cared, they would have reacted in a way that anybody else would react when, when somebody is charged with a crime and found guilty. You know, I'm I'm a student of true crime. I studied criminal and forensic psychology. And when you go to these trials and you see this young person charged with a very serious crime, like aggravated manslaughter or murder two or even murder one, you don't see the other side cheering as much. Yeah, maybe once in a while you get a slap and finally justice. But they're not cheering, you know, saying good. You know, this is good for America or whatever or something like that. 
there's always a general consensus of sadness. Not only did that person kill their loved one or an associate to that loved one, but they too now have their life ruined. And a moral person, which is the general public, not Congress, they're apathetic to human affairs. Moral public will look at them and basically give a statement and say, you know, I feel sorry for you. You ruined your life because of your ignorance or your criminality. And not only did you affect one life, you affected everybody around you. The left didn't do that, predictably. They cheered. Now, let me show you the hypocrisy of the left because they don't care about justice. And the ignorance of the left in the general public is just as worrisome for me anyway. Because even though I'm you know, a hopeless pessimist and I always think the worst, I do have, I do hold out a small portion of hope that through the ashes of our own destruction will rise a, a better future. And what I mean by this is that I think we need to, at this point, if we're not going to turn it around anytime soon, then we need to be destroyed so that the future of this world or this country can basically grow into a country that we once hoped for, a world we once hoped for. But it's not going to come anytime soon if we don't make the changes. Now, let me clarify this. When Obama was president, he basically was supposed to be that hope and change. That's what he ran on. Okay? He ran on that. Here's an African-American. He's good looking. He's relatively young and really gave hope to the most debased, the most um, financially deprived minority in this country. And that is, I'm not talking about African-Americans, but they're a part of this and a big part of this. Talk about classes, the lower class the middle class. Finally, we broke the chain. All right, look, it's not a Caucasian, a rich guy from a background. He looks like one of us, but he wasn't. Now, Obama is not the pioneer of illegal and offensive wars that the United States engaged in in the last 20 years prior to him. You could thank Reagan and the Bush administrations. Still, he is an expansionist. And he ordered the most drone strikes in presidential history. Triple the times of the Bush administration. In fact, the Bush administration, some of their um, aides in the White House, and especially in the Pentagon, basically were envious, according to the Harvard Political Review, and they wrote an article, a great article, by the way, by Prince Williams. And I'm going to link that in the bottom of the screen. This article is great. He wrote this in 2021. Quote, during his presidency, Obama approved the use of 563 drone strikes that killed approximately 3,797 people. In fact, Obama authorized 54 drone strikes alone in Pakistan during his first year in office. One of the first CIA drone strikes under President Obama was a funeral. A funeral. Murdering 41 Pakistani civilians. End quote. 
Now, Pakistan was the hub of drone operations during Obama's first term, led by the CIA. Now, the CIA has, and the Pakistan ISI, the Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, which is, you know, really, that's a tentative relationship, if I ever saw one. And I did, I did a, you know, a long article, uh, which I posted about a couple of days ago, regarding the history of the ISI. It was fascinating. Nevertheless, um, it was from here that Obama basically said to Pakistan, now, this, this, Relationship existed a long time ago. But after 9-11, the Bush administration basically told Pakistan, um, we're going to use your country as a springboard to basically conduct attacks in Afghanistan. And Pakistan basically agreed because they didn't want to be, you know, getting the same treatment as Afghanistan, later Iraq. So they allowed for U.S. Uh, airstrikes to be conducted from uh, Pakistan, Peshawar and Jalalabad uh, to Afghanistan against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Meanwhile, Pakistan was the springboard for Taliban and Al-Qaeda in the 1980s. Now, in 2010, there were 128 drone strikes that killed at least 110 civilians in Afghanistan. And to make matters worse, Obama also began ordering air campaign strikes targeting Yemen because we were also at the same time allied with Saudi Arabia, which still exists, although that's tentative now, in which his first strike was an absolute catastrophe. And according to the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, quote, U.S. commanders thought they were targeting Al-Qaeda, but instead hit a tribe with cluster munitions, killing 55 people, including 21 children, 10 of them under the age of five, 12 were women, five of them were pregnant, end quote. Right? And through, all throughout 2010, as well as the first half of the first six months of 2011, Obama sporadically used airstrikes against Yemen, and the air the um, the air campaign that Obama authorized began in earnest, and they began using drones and jets to help the Yemeni ground forces to defeat the Houthis. And forced out Al Qaeda forces who had taken advantage of the country's Arab Spring that happened. But Saudi Arabia basically began conducting war crimes of their own. And now, to this date, I think it's over um, 455,000 people killed. It's the largest humanitarian crisis. By the way, it enormous it just it is so enormous in terms of like catastrophe that ukraine shouldn't even be on the same screen but yet ukraine is every single day yemen not so much why because they are conducting illegal war crimes with the help of the united states now, the United States is involved in Ukraine, but that's a covert operation, supposedly. Anyway, Yemen is not. We are actually giving Saudi Arabia, I made another video previously, where Saudi Arabia is the largest exporter, the largest purchaser of U.S. weapons in the world, bar none. Those weapons, in fact, when Biden first came into office and he ran on the, the promise that the U.S. would not conduct weapon sales with Saudi Arabia, knowing what was going on in Yemen. What did he do the first two weeks in office? He made the biggest military aid package deal in history with Saudi Arabia. And those weapons went to Yemen.
And, you know, when you have these drug strikes that Obama committed, and it was seven Arab countries, Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Pakistan, Yemen, Syria, and Libya. Libya in itself was a major war crime. Remember the video, Hillary Clinton? We came, we saw he died. Libya was a prosperous North African country. Didn't have so much in the way of an Islamist problem. But because of Hillary Clinton's and Susan Rice and Samantha Powers, all Obama administrative uh, aides and Secretary of State um, basically pressured Obama and Vice President Biden, who didn't initially, was against the idea of killing Gaddafi, but fell into pressure from Clinton, basically, and Susan Rice. So Libya now is an open-air slave market with Al-Qaeda and Islamic State affiliates fighting against the transitional armies. Syria, um, in which Obama authorized or approved, he didn't authorize it. That authorization came from CIA director, then CIA director, David Petraeus, which was given foreign support by Turkey, Israel, and Jordan uh, for a CIA program called Timber Sycamore. And I've done a couple of videos about this. If you want to know more about that, just go to my channel under the search bar, Timber Sycamore, um, in which Obama approved of sending military and financial logistical support to Al-Qaeda affiliates. Not to Al-Qaeda, allegedly, but those weapons went to them in Islamic State anyway, because the black market works that way. And the CIA authorized, through Saudi Arabia, uh, the sending of weapons to these Salafi rebels. In fact, they were called rebels by the White House. Just like the Mujahideen were called rebels or our freedom fighters in 1979. They're terrorists. These are jihadists, Salafi jihadists that don't read the Quran. They're hypocrites and liars, murderers. Takfiris, who, who believe that anybody who uh, doesn't uh, adhere to the Salafi or Wahhabi principles are fake Muslims or mudafiq. Takfiri Muslims are people are Muslims who convict other Muslims as being of uh, an apostate. Now, all of this that I just told you, the invasion of Libya, the invasion of Syria, the support of these Al Qaeda affiliates with weapons aid, um, the drone strikes in seven Arab countries that killed approximately uh, 17,000 people. These all make a strong case for categorizing Obama as an international war criminal. And the 1949 Geneva Conventions, which are ratified by the United Nations, are explicitly, explicitly protective in which they provide um, political protection for even the wounded. Not just for civilians, but for medical and religious personnel. Um, and medical transport. Now, I, I always like to like to bring up the Rome Statutes, the International Criminal Courts, by the way, which the United States are not co-signers of. I wonder why. Israel's not co-signers either. 
neither is Iraq or North Korea. Maybe that's the reason why they continue to engage in illegal activities without care for uh, being prosecuted for them. Because they know that the international criminal courts can't do nothing about it. Anyway, Article 8 of the Rome Statutes state that, quote, and I'm going to read from the International Criminal Courts. By the way, I've uploaded all this to my WordPress. Go to my Twitter. It's on a pin, pin tweet. Go to my WordPress. Type in Rome Statute. It, I have it all laid out, page by page. Right. I'm reading from Article 8. Quote, internationally directing attacks against personnel, installations, material units, or vehicles involved in a humanitarian assistance or peacekeeping mission in accordance with the Charter of the United States is classified as a war crime. And also, at the bottom of the page, quote, internationally launching an attack in the knowledge that such an attack will cause incidental loss of life or injury to civilians also constitutes as a war crime and crimes of aggression, end quote. Let me give you one example, because I could sit here and give you example after example of the drone strikes that Obama ordered, and you left this nothing. In fact, you voted for this guy for a second term. And what did he do in his second term was violate the civil rights of everyday Americans. He allowed for the NSA to illegally, and I quote this, illegally obtain your personal information through your cell phone providers like AT&T. Look up Mark Klein, room 671A. Now, one example is the Kunduz Trauma Center. I did a video about this because this is a terrible story. Now, the Kunduz Trauma Center is located in the Kunduz province in Afghanistan. And this took place on October 3rd, 2015. Now, the hospital was operated by the Medicine Sans Frontiers, which is the Doctors Without Borders, which is a charity that provides humanitarian medical care. in which Obama authorized a drone strike at this hospital in which 42 people were killed and 30 people were injured. Later, when the international uh, uh, community, Doctors Without Borders pressured to, they pressured Doctors Without Borders to write a report, and they did, in which the Medicine Sans Frontiers condemned the incident, calling it a deliberate breach of international humanitarian law and a war crime. They also said that all the warrant parties have been notified about the hospital and its operations months in advance. So that means the United States should have known about this hospital, wasn't a Taliban safe haven. What did the United States basically say? Well, the Pentagon basically said that the airstrike was carried out to defend U.S. forces on the ground. But then later, General John F. Campbell, who is the commander of the Resolute Support Mission and was the commander of the International Security Assistance Force, basically came out and said that the airstrike was requested by the Afghan forces who had come under the Taliban. and told the media that they wouldn't intentionally target a protected medical facility. Meanwhile, the hospital was known to Afghan government, U.S. government, and the military. But there was, uh, now according to Slate Magazine on October 16th, written by Joshua Keating, they quote that anonymous sources alleged that cockpit recordings showed the AC-130 crew questioned the strike's legality. 
So even the bombers questioned whether this was a legal strike because they knew what they were doing. Now, the Rome Statutes established four core international crimes. You have genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and crimes of aggression. Now, these crimes aren't subject to any statute of limitations. So Obama can still be prosecuted under these. Prosecuted. And under the Rome Statutes, the International Criminal Courts can only investigate and prosecute the four core international crimes I mentioned in situations where the state, this is a good one, are unable and willing to do so themselves. However, there's another problem. The United States are now co-signers of the International Criminal Courts. And so, what I say to you leftists, those who support Obama and those who vilify Donald Trump, you're a hypocrite. You don't care about justice. You care only when the rule of law applies to your adversary, not to yourselves. And I condemn all of you. Not just you on the left, you also on the right, because you're the same way. You were yelling, lock her up with Hillary Clinton. Yeah, I agree. She belongs under the jail. However, we don't live in a just world. We don't live in a just country. We live in a country where justice only applies to the lower classes, the middle classes. They only apply to the people that have no power, that have no financial means. You can't bribe your way out of here. Meaning bribe, I'm not talking about bribing the judge, but paying for a high-priced lawyer to basically haggle down your charges. That's a bribe. Because a defense lawyer that you, that's adjudicated to you by the courts basically gets a thousand cases and basically wants your case you know, out of the way right away. He takes all these cases because it helps him grow into a, you know, a real high-priced lawyer. Now, I'm not saying that the court system doesn't get it right once in a while. They do. And I love this statement from people saying, we have the best judicial system in the world. No, we don't. If we had the best judicial system in the world, barely anyone would be in prison. But the opposite is true. We imprison more people than any country on the face of the earth. Even for crimes that are not even violent. Even for people that can't help it, the mentally disabled. Because in this country, we are, I think, one of the worst countries on the face face of the earth when it comes to mental health. We are so uniquely ignorant when it comes to this. Years ago, we would shock these people into vegetables. Now we just imprison them. Never mind the growing rate of homelessness in this country or the exorbitant rates of rent prices. The billions of dollars going into a war in Ukraine. The millions, the hundreds of millions going to Yemen. And meanwhile, the right of declaring war on Iran, China, and North Korea? We are a broken country. Morally, spiritually, I'm atheist, but most people are not. And I'm talking to them too. We're broken. We need to fix it. And if we can't fix this country right away, then we are going to leave our children a broken home where the rule of law does not exist or does not apply to those select few people. And I would say that that's the biggest crime of all. 